Welcome to Back to the Bible. If being holy sounds a little too pious to be real, then listen up as Brian takes you to 1 Peter for a fresh look at holiness and the hope it brings to your life. He'll add more detail to that message when he joins Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney in studio later in the program. All right, let's go to Brian Clark for today's message, starting in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So now as obedient children, now we, we have been radically born again through the grace and mercy of God. I am now God's child, and my desire is to walk in obedience. He says we should not return to our former lusts. The word lust there doesn't necessarily have to refer to evil things. They're just simply the desires of my heart that I was seeking to satisfy through the things of this world. Before my relationship with God, I had legitimate, deep longings, deep within my soul, but I did not know how to satisfy them. I tried all kinds of things in this world to find something that would ultimately satisfy, but nothing satisfied. I lived that way because I was ignorant of what was happening. I was ignorant of what my soul was ultimately longing for. But now that I experienced new life in Christ, now I understand why those things of the world were not satisfying, why that wasn't working. Why now that I know the truth, would I ever go back to those things I was doing in my ignorance. So in essence, that's what he's saying. Therefore, now, as obedient children, do not be conformed, kind of squeezed into the mold of this world. Don't go back to those behaviors, to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. So don't do that. So what should you do? Well, we should seek to be holy as God is holy. He ends that paragraph with a quote, from Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. So what exactly does that mean? If I was to say to you, don't be conformed to your former ways of life, but instead be holy as God is holy. Have a nice day. See you next week. You're still left with the question, I don't know what that means. What does it mean to be holy? It's kind of that vague religious language that sounds good, but you kind of walk away saying, I I don't know what that means. Kind of conjures up images of like a halo. Maybe you glow a little bit. Maybe it's full of lots of religious behavior, religious language. Maybe I say everything's a blessing. You know, whatever sounds kind of holy, religious-like. When my girls were younger and uh, living at home, they would invite their friends over, and sometimes their friends were a little intimidated. I mean, it's, it's the pastor's house. So I used to say to them, just tell them, your dad's like anyone else except he glows in the dark. It's kind of the imagery of... Is that that holy? Is that? Sometimes we also kind of get this idea that now that I have a ticket to heaven, I'm obligated to obey the rules, so that's holy. Here are the rules, you have to do them. There's kind of this negative tone to it. But that isn't what it's talking about at all. The word holy, uh, the root word, means to be different. It means to be other. I think my favorite definition of holiness is other than. God is holy because he's utterly other than anyone else in the universe. Basically, the idea is this. Before God created, God existed. 
eternally in eternity past. Even though God is one, yet he is three persons. We were introduced in the introduction of this letter to God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, with the reminder that all three members of the Trinity are busy at work to bring about the fulfillment of the promise of salvation. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is kind of this strange, wondrous, mysterious doctrine that frankly none of us can get our minds around. But the relevance is that from eternity past, God has been a relational God. God existed in a relationship with himself. The Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Spirit, the Spirit loving the Father. The Father celebrating and glorifying and enjoying the Son, the Son, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Father. So there has been this, this life that has defined God forever. That is the very essence of life. Theologians refer to this as the dance of God. When you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, we were created as people made in the image of God. In essence, to be relational as God is relational, in a way that separates us from all other creation. In order that we might enter into the depth of the life and the love and the relationship that has defined God forever. That was God's intent. That is essentially what we were made for. But once Adam and Eve sinned, sin separated all of us from God. So we feel that deeply. In this world, there's this sense that I was made for something different than this. I was made for something more than this. There's kind of this restless feeling in our soul that somehow I think there's supposed to be more. I was made for more. And what that is, is my soul's longing for the world as God intended it to be. Longing to enter into that life as God defines it. Essentially, the offer of salvation is the offer, the invitation to join the dance. We experience it to some degree now, but in its complete fulfillment at the revelation or the return of Jesus Christ. That's essentially what salvation is. So when Jesus is talking about eternal life, it's not just a duration of life, but it's a quality of life. This is life as God intended it to be. This is the fullness of life that is found in God. And on the basis of our salvation, we're, entered, we're invited into the dance. So the idea of being holy is the idea of being utterly other than this world. To understand that life is found in God. It's found in the salvation that he offers. This is the life that has defined God forever. He's so utterly other than everything else in this world. And now as his child, why would I return back to the futile, empty ways of life that just left me disappointed and wounded and confused again and again and again when he's actually called me to enter into this life that is utterly other than anything this world can offer. God says, be holy as I am holy. Why? Because that's where the fullness of life is found. That's where we find life. That's where we find joy. That's where we find peace. That's where we find hope. That's the essence of what he's saying there. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, you'll find today's program along with older messages at backtothebible.org. And while you're there, browse our devotions, Bible studies, and Bible plans. You'll find a wide variety there, all designed to help you experience a deeper relationship with Jesus. That's at backtothebible.org. Visit today, backtothebible.org. Now back to our message in 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's Brian Clark. Verse 17, if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, 
Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Basically what that paragraph is saying is that the one that you now as a child of God call father, there's a sense of relationship and intimacy there that now has been made possible. Never forget that the one that you call father is still the sovereign judge of the universe. This is still the one who will judge every man according to his or her works. This is the God that ultimately brings condemnation on sin. The idea of fear is not so much afraid, but a deep respect. Basically, the idea is that now that we call God Father, now that we are no longer under the condemnation of our sin, but rather we have been forgiven on the basis of the blood of Jesus. Why would we return to our old, sinful, futile ways? The idea is now that you call the ultimate judge father, don't somehow convince yourself that sin is somehow not that big a deal. Don't kind of uh, diminish the reality or the, the offense of sin. Don't somehow trivialize your sin. That now on the basis of the grace of God, God's got it covered, doesn't really bother him all that much, no big deal, no harm, no foul. It's actually saying, no, actually the opposite. Now that you call the ultimate judge your father, you should be so aware that sin is so offensive to God that it actually separated us from God. It actually is so offensive to God that God brings condemnation on that sin. And for those that don't experience God's salvation, they will be ultimately judged and condemned forever because sin is offensive to God. So now that you have been saved, now you call the judge your father, don't somehow trivialize sin and excuse it and think it's no big deal because God's grace covers it all. So he reminds us, of the cost, what it costs God to forgive your sin. He says, your sin is so offensive to God that you actually had to be purchased, redeemed. It's a slave market term. You were purchased out of the slave market of sin in order to be set free before God. The purchase price was so great, it could not possibly be paid by something as worthless as gold and silver. The only thing that had enough value to purchase you out of the slave market of sin is the precious blood of the lamb, the sinless son of God. That it actually cost God his son to pay the purchase Price to cover your sin because it's that offensive to God. There is a reminder that this son that shed his blood was actually the eternal creator of the universe, that he existed before there was anything else. Somehow, some way, the eternal God, the Genesis 1-1 creator God, took on human flesh. Peter essentially says he actually lived in our lifetime. He walked this earth while Peter and the first readers were alive on earth. In order to shed his blood to provide salvation for future generations, awaiting the return of Christ. 
we learned that we live in the generation, in the time period since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that the prophets looked forward to and wondered who would be the lucky generation that would live in the fulfillment of the salvation God promises. Something so spectacular that the angels long to look on, to watch what God is doing. We happen to be the generation, all those since the resurrection of Christ, who actually live in the fulfillment of everything God promised. And all we await now is the return of Christ and the fulfillment of everything God has promised. He says the ultimate result then would be to the glory of God and that we as his children would find our faith and our hope in God. If verses 3 through 12 are true, therefore, we should not go back to the empty way of life that defined us before. We should not be seeking to satisfy our deepest longings and needs in the things of this world. We did that when we were ignorant, but we're not ignorant anyway anymore. We should not go back to that empty way of life but realize that life is found in God. It's found in this other than way that is so different from everything this world offers and that can only be found in a relationship with God. We remind ourselves that our salvation was so costly to God that we should never trivialize sin, but rather we should seek to walk in obedience. We should walk in holiness because that's where life is found. Ultimately, then, we find our hope. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your pain, regardless of your confusion, regardless of your heartache, regardless of anything you're going through, no matter what this world throws at you, our hope is found in God. Our minds are fixated on the grace to be revealed when Jesus returns. If you have trusted Christ as Savior, no matter what happens on this earth, your future is absolutely spectacular. And that is the basis for your hope. But here's the deal. This is not how we just think naturally. Just because you heard this doesn't mean somehow by osmosis it sinks in and that's how you will think tomorrow. There is no one that is so spiritual that this is your default mode. I absolutely guarantee you this is not your default mode. The only way to experience the joy, the peace, and the hope that can be yours in the most difficult moments of life is it is absolutely necessary to get your game face on and to understand in those difficult moments of life, I have to fixate my mind clearly disciplined in my thinking to remember that ultimately my hope is found in the grace that will be revealed in the return of Christ. It is only when we with all of our self-discipline and mental skills get our game face on, get in the zone, and in those moments focus that we remember no matter what, no matter what, I have every reason for hope. It's the only way you're going to live as a hope-filled person, living in the midst of a culture of despair. Now Brian Clark joins us in the studio with author Kara Whitney and Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole. Brian, thanks for the reminder to stay focused. I need that. Earlier this year in our study of Genesis, you referred to our world as the land of the dying. That seems to parallel now with your description of our culture of despair. 
Yeah, I think it is similar. It's got the same core issue, which we've talked about. How do you find that which satisfies apart from God? doesn't mean they're always doing bad or evil things. They just can't figure out how to find significance and value and, and to satisfy these longings within, which creates the world system. And a world system without God can only lead to despair. Uh, so when we had our, our Life After Death series, we even talked about that's like at the core of the definition of hell. It's a place forever longing, but never able to have those longings satisfied. Brian, when we start to realize that people around us are literally dying, it should motivate us to help them, shouldn't it? Absolutely, it should. So whether they're dying physically, which we all are in some process of that, but emotionally, spiritually, I think we just underestimate how much the people around us are in pain. And we have to move away from this us versus them and viewing them as the enemy and realize these are people in pain and that leads to bad behavior and bad attitudes and, and solutions that will never work. But at some point, we roll up our sleeves, we get in the mess, and, and hopefully we have opportunities to share with them the truth that has set us free. So you talked more about holiness in this message. It isn't so much a matter of obligation now as it is living the life my soul was searching for and found in Christ, right? That is so important. So many Christians have their ticket to heaven. Now they feel the duty to clean up their act as a way of saying thank you to God. And that just isn't what it is. It's not a duty, it's not a payoff because I have a ticket to heaven. It's realizing this is the life that my soul has always longed for. And I finally found it and that should create within me a genuine passion for righteousness. So Brian, in 1 Peter 1.17, it tells us to conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. So tell me exactly, what does it look like to conduct yourself in fear? Well, fear meaning not so much afraid, but respect. So respect that this is serious stuff. We're dealing with matters of life and death and eternity. That sin is so offensive to God, it actually cost him the life of his own son. So none of that should be minimized or taken for granted. Uh, Eternity hangs in the balance. So it's a reminder, we have a mission to accomplish and we need to take that very seriously. Thanks for listening today. Please join us again tomorrow for more encouragement from God's word here on Back to the Bible. 